Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. The common occurrence for us so often is that after we have this mountaintop experience, which you can't get better than what they had there, can you? Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop with Jesus, Moses and Elijah come. You can't get better than that in this world. And then they come off the mountain, and as soon as they come off it, we read this. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, scribes arguing with them, and immediately the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him, and he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And so I say that this is a common occurrence because I think it's important for us to see that you're not the only one. We, we live a life full of ups and downs. This is, this is the text where the proverb comes from. The saying comes from the mountaintop experience to the, down in the valley. How are you doing? Well, it's been a season of, of, uh, of being down in a valley. Anybody ever heard of that? Am I the only one? I grew up in the church, so I heard of all of these things, mountaintop, valley, and this is where it comes from. It can't get better than this. This is not just the pattern of life in the world. This is the pattern for the Christian. This is the pattern that sees ups and downs. People ask me often, how's it going with the church? And I used to, I used to tell them, based on week to week, how it's going, and now I just tell them it is the way of, of life. One week, it just feels like it can't get better. You look out and you see a trajectory that you're on and it's just like everybody is coming together. There's a growth, there's a spirit of enjoyment and receiving of the word of God and then one week comes and you just think, where did all that go? And sometimes this is bound up in me and my own failures to walk by faith and not by sight. But we're all a part of this common occurrence. This is part of how we are living our life. You come down from a mountain where Peter had said it was so good, let's just stay here. Peter says, it's good that we're here. How about me, I'll build a tent for Jesus? Probably that's what Peter, I'm not, I'm putting that in Peter's <laughs> mouth there. James and John can build one for Moses and Elijah and we'll just stay here. Because down there, we know what's going to happen down there. But do you know that this is also uh, a good picture for us in ministry, isn't it? For the Christian life. I don't know about you, but I look forward to the gathering of the saints. I look forward to the, this moment where we can come together, we can rejoice in the Lord, and you don't have to worry about with your confession and your joy in the Lord, somebody saying, you're so ignorant. How can you be so superstitious? How can you be so stupid to believe in, in, a, in, a, in a God who would send his only son to die, to be tortured, to be humiliated, to be shamed so that you could be saved? Who are you? What are you so important? What makes you so good? And you confess, no, it's not me. I'm not so good. It's all of grace. It's all of God's love. It's all, oh, that's just the most ridiculous thing. Why should he care about us? And the wisdom of the, the world and the wisdom of the wise, they not only think the gospel is foolish, but they think those are foolish who follow and believe the gospel. And then you see the sin in the world that's out in the world and promoted by the world and the death and the, 
and the destruction that comes because of sin and, and people giving themselves over to it and the pain and the misery of it. And you just want to be in a place where people love the Lord. Yes, we're going through hard things, but people will encourage one another in the Lord. People will love each other here. If you offend one another, you can expect that as long as you are repentant of that, you will be forgiven here. You will be received here. You, for, you offend somebody 70 times 70, and you expect that if you are truly repentant, they will receive you again here. There is room for offense, and there's room for forgiveness. That's a great place to be. In the world, that's not how it is often. You offend somebody in this world, and that's it. There is a joy. There, is a mount, there ought to be a mountaintop experience when we come together. How about just the hearing of the word of God? There's life in this. There's water of life. There's bread of life. This is the word of God that we are to eat and be filled and full. This is where our hope is based on. This is where the promises of God are ours and our children's. But we're not called to stay here forever. We're called to go out into this world and make disciples. We're called to be diligent, to labor with our hands, the thing that is good. We're called to do good works before men, be salt and light, so that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. We are called to resist the devil. We're called to go out there six days a week into the world, to come out from this mountain, go out into that world and see God move mountains, as it were. And I don't want to get too poetic or proverbial there, but that's what our text is all about. You, you come down off that mountain because there's a time where we're just going to be enjoying that mountain top forever. This is not that time. There's spiritual warfare to be about, to take part in. There's ministry, there's service, there's sacrifice. This is what Jesus is on the earth for. Jesus was already in the splendor of his Father's glory for eternity. He had everything. He came and humbled himself so that he would go down and mix it up with us. You know, we can look at them. We can look at the, the, the world through the eyes of us and them. In a sense, that's true, we're the saints, but in a sense, we were them before the gospel came to us before God's grace changed us. And so we're called to go, get off the mountain, go mix it up, be in the battlefield. Here there is a great crowd and scribes are there and there's this turmoil, there's this argument going on. We don't know exactly the details the text gives us. I think the basic, basic uh, underlining reason for this division as we'll see, it's coming together, and Jesus adds, what are you arguing with them about? Now, we find out that they were amazed when they saw Jesus, and I think that with the question and, and what follows gives us the answer to that question, what are you arguing about? And we see that in verses 17 and 18. We see that there it's answered as a father's witness. Number two, a father's witness. And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And I think this is the basis for the argument. And you can imagine, it's not hard to imagine that once they had brought, this man had brought his son to Jesus. He was intending to bring him to Jesus and he wasn't around, Jesus wasn't there. And so he brought him to his disciples. And we can, we can almost see this unraveling because the disciples, if you remember, were already sent by Jesus with his own, own authority to heal people of their infirmities, to cast out demons, Mark 6, 12 through 13, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed many 
with oil who were sick and healed them. So the disciples were not only sent out, they were successful in their sending previously when Jesus had sent them out. And so they come looking for Jesus. This man, this father comes looking for Jesus, finds his disciples, and the disciples say, yeah, we can do this. We can do this. Jesus, we did it before. And so they come, he comes to the disciples. They give, he gives uh, to them his son, and, and they couldn't do it. And so in my mind, what then happens is you have this crowd gathered and you have the scribes there who are already, we know, enemies of Jesus at this time. And they start calling into question the whole validity of the whole thing. You see, your claims about doing powerful works from God and this Jesus who you follow, they're proven to be false. This doesn't just call the disciples into question and their truthfulness and what they've been witnessing, but even Jesus, especially Jesus, because the master was known by his disciples. And so it calls Jesus' entire ministry into question. And it comes down off the mountain, and it seems to me this is the fundamental basic argument that's taking place. Are you valid disciples of a valid rabbi? A teacher with authority who has the right to be teaching the things of God, the one true and living God, having disciples and having a following. And this seems to be what the argument must be about. Those who represented Jesus were unable to cast out this demon from this child. And so that seems to be the dilemma. But listen to this father's description He says, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him mute. Some people argue that this spirit was merely epilepsy. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, the Greek word there can be translated epilepsy. Uh, it's, it was translated lunatic, but it has the same idea. Moonstruck was what the Greek word literally means. It means somebody who is just taken and has a, a look of paralyzation while they convulse. That's exactly what happens to this boy. He has a spirit that causes him not to be able to speak and has these epileptic seizures. And so some have said, well, he's just got this infirmity. There are some that deny the supernatural that say this. And every time that we see a demon spoken of in Mark's gospel, we see the term unclean spirit along with that. And Jesus used the term spirit only in this narrative, but Mark, as he describes it, uses the term unclean spirit to describe the spirit. And then in Matthew's gospel, Matthew uses the term demon to describe this spirit. So this is not a natural problem. This is a supernatural possession of a demonic spirit in this boy. That's what we see taking place here. And so it is clear that the disciples were unable to cast out a particular demon from this boy. And that's what led to the quarrel. And third, we see Jesus' disappointment, verse 19. Could we say Jesus' frustration as we read this? If we do, if you think of frustration here, because there's a sense of emotion that Jesus displays here. You know, disappointment, we have, you can be disappointed and have no emo emotion. There's a sense of disappointment here, but whatever you think about this, don't imagine that this frustration has to do with an inability to do anything about it. The emotion that Christ displays here is real, it's palpable. He answered to them, he answered, O oh, faithless generation, you don't lead with O, oh, that's an exasperation. You don't lead with that unless you are overwhelmed in some sense. You are just passionate. Your passion is overflowing about something. And the first thing he says is a faithless generation. Jesus was surrounded by it during his ministry. Hebrews 12.3 says of Jesus that we are to consider him who endured from such hostility or contradiction of sinners. You know, Jesus 
<laughs> he didn't surround himself with the best and brightest. In fact, the whole concept of best and brightest is one thing I want to challenge you on this morning. Jesus was surrounded completely on this earth by sinners, just like you and I. Now, we're surrounded by sinners, but there's a big difference between you and I and Christ. He wasn't a sinner. That's a massive difference. How do you feel when you're in the right and there are people in the wrong around you? <laughs> don't tell me you've... You, you don't feel any sort of twisting inside your stomach. You know, your kids do things that just, you just can't conceive. Why would anybody do that? This is Jesus all the time with sinners. All the time. All the time. You heard the term Karen today. N she actually doesn't mind the use, even though I think that it's sort of an absurd thing. But you know what that means. It's sort of that self-righteous person who, who just reacts erratically and crazy because she knows she's right and she knows you're wrong, right? But we all have that sense where when we're right, we can't believe it that anybody else is wrong. But Jesus is truly right all the time. <laughs> we're often not even justified when we're in that frame of mind. Jesus is truly right all the time. But what is this directed to? What is his statement, his disappointment, his frustration directed at? He says, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. I believe his frustration is not just with the crowds around him. I think it's with his own disciples. I think it's with those who should have known better. You see, we've seen already in chapter 4, verse 40, Jesus said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And we see in chapter 8, Verse 17 through 21, and Jesus said, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said 12. And seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? You can also go to... Uh, chapter 6, verse 50 through 52. All of those narratives, they, they are after Jesus has performed so many signs and wonders. He even sent them out to do the same. And they still don't get it. They still don't believe. They still don't understand. I believe the grounds of Jesus' frustration was due to his own disciples not representing him as they should have. He says, O oh, faithless generation, it doesn't refer to their failure, I don't believe, but their, meaning their failure to heal, but their failure to believe. He says, oh, faithless generation. He doesn't say anything about that they didn't heal the boy. He said, you don't trust me. Does this seem harsh to you? We can't understand this as being harsh if we think to ourselves man if I would have been there I would have got it Jesus should have found better disciples why did he choose these 12 you see if we start pointing our fingers if we start pointing our fingers at the disciples and not understand the context in which the scriptures speak we don't understand that there are no better disciples there aren't any. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you would have been there at that time, you wouldn't have been better than them. You wouldn't have. You aren't better than them. The only people that Jesus had to call to himself were not the best and brightest. He only had sinners to choose from. 
That's who he came to save. Was sinners. And he did. And yes, there would be moments where, and we should take away from this, that they should have known. And we should have known. But what this teaches us is how deeply we are in bondage to sin apart from Christ and apart from the grace of God to open our eyes. It's not just that we need a little bit more information. It's not the intellectual who, if I just knew a little bit more, if I just saw a little bit more supernatural signs and wonders, then I'll believe. They're just fooling themselves. There is a great chasm between you and God, and that is created because of sin, your sin. Paul says that chasm is that you are likened unto someone who is dead, unable, spiritually speaking, to do anything good. That means anything by faith. You need to be raised to life spiritually. And every one of us who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as I've said over and over again, Oh, all of the glory and praise to God and none of it to ourselves. But Jesus chose them. And he knew one of them was the devil, but he chose 11 of them for eternal life. And he bore with them a person that had every right at, at the, any moment they failed to say, get out of my sight. Jesus had that right. Any moment they failed, get out of my sight, you failed. And they failed over and over again. And he bore with them. And he bore with them. And eventually he went to the cross for them. And he bore their sin. These he would redeem with his own blood, who couldn't get things right, though they were with him and saw his works and heard his words. They couldn't get it right, and he redeemed them. Not because they could get it together, but because they couldn't. That is the measure of the love of God for sinners. All would reject him. And although all would reject him, all of his disciples would scatter when the shepherd was struck. He remained faithful. Even at his death, at his lowest point, there was no one to take up his cause. Peter, who has something to say about everything, the only thing he did was curse and swear that he didn't know Jesus three times. And this just shows that unless Jesus dies, unless he dies, there is no salvation for any of us. Peter is redeemed, beloved. He's a pillar of the church. Why, because he was so great? No, because of Christ's great love. Why are you going to enjoy eternal life? The only answer is because of his great love, his mercies, his power, his grace. No one spoke up for him. No one remained faithful to defend him. And this is why he died, because there was no other righteous person. Isaiah 50, verses 1 through 6, describes this in a profound way, prophetically, to the prophet. The first three verses of Isaiah 50 speak of mankind's failure, even of God's redeemed people, Israel, of their failure. Thus saith the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce of which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgression your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man why, when I called, was there no one to answer? That is, there's none among you of Israel that has been faithful to me. Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, my rebuke. 
By my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of waters and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. None of you have been faithful to me so that by you I could use you to save my people. And then verse 4 says, The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who was weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backwards. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. The first three verses are the failure of man. The last three are the success of the Son of Man. Foretold, Jesus would be faithful, even to the point of death. And that's how we would be redeemed. Four, help my unbelief, verses 20 through 24. And they brought the boy to him, and when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. It convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Notice this conflict. Notice this conflict. As soon as the Spirit saw him, it convulsed the boy. Just like every other time, the demonic spirits and Satan himself, they knew who Jesus was. They knew Jesus was their enemy. And they responded in like matter. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. We don't know how old the boy was. The text doesn't tell us. But evidently it was some time. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. And I would take this to say that this is evidence that Satan and his kingdom, they seek the destruction of man. We're made in God's image. They don't delight in us. You know, there's a whole movement of Satanists these days. They think they're so clever. They think they're an intellectual movement. And yet they stand for everything that the Bible says they would stand for, being against God. Satan hates mankind. He hates them. He's deceiving them. He will destroy them if he has, unless God stops him from doing it. But if you can do anything, and I want you to hear this, the Father says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And in verse 22 is really where I want to focus our attention on. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And who of us doesn't recognize the earnestness of a father's plea? If you have children, you know. There's, there's one thing, if you're a father, your mother, it's, it's the well-being of your children that you care about. We, as human beings, I think have a, I think God's law in regards to, we have a conscience towards those who are weak. We know we shouldn't subject, sub, subject them. Yes, we do not listen to that, and we do reject that conscience, that knowledge of God, often as sinners. But when it comes to children, we are often the most zealous. Even in prison, it's been a long-standing tradition in prisons. Some of the worst high maxim maximal security prisons that if you're a child molester there, you're not safe. These are people who perform all manner of wicked things, but if that is what you do, if that's what you're in there for, you're not safe. Now we are in a society in a day and age where we are now promoting the mutilation of our children. That is a signal that we are at the end of a society as a whole. But I want you to know, in idolatrous, in idolatrous places, they have always not a, had a high view of children as Christians have had. Every idolatrous nation that Christianity has come into, 